Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're connecting from. I'm Ira Feldman. I'm the MEPTEC Executive Director, and I would like to welcome you to today's Semiconductor Industry Speaker Series produced by MEPTEC and IMAPS. So thank you very much to uh, have you, having you join us. Uh, we will be working on announcing additional uh, speaker series throughout the year, typically on Wednesdays at 8 I say Wednesdays at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. If you are interested in speaking or would like to propose a speaker or topic, uh, please send me email, ira at meptech.org, or feel free to respond to any of the MEPTEC emails, and I'll get the message. So uh, looking forward to some suggestions, and we'll certainly announce additional speakers once we have them confirmed. Um, in terms of events, the next MEPTEC event will be a virtual event the mornings of March 15th and 16th, the continuation in our Road to Chiplet series, which will focus on heterogeneous integration testability, and we will be uh, announcing the program shortly. We have a great uh, selection of speakers uh, coordinated to talk about this important topic to making chiplets a commercial reality. In terms of MEPTEC, we are membership supported, uh, both at the individual and corporate level. If you haven't renewed or you haven't joined, uh, would you uh, kindly take a look at our website, meptech.org, or send any questions you have to Betty Cooper, Cooper at meptech.org. Uh, this support enables us to do free events like this and our virtual uh, workshops. So we thank you for your support. Uh, just some reminders uh, the slides and videos will be posted by next week. Uh, the slides will be on meptech.org and the video will be on youtube.com on our YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel, uh, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and then YouTube will let you know as soon as the video is posted. Uh, during Jan's presentation, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A tool, not the chat tool to help me organize them so we can uh, address them with Jan. With that, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce Jan Vargaman of TechSearch International, who will be talking on semiconductor packaging and assembly trends outlook for 2020. Jan is the president and founder of TechSearch International, where she and her team have been uh, doing market research and technology trend analysis in semiconductor packaging since 1987. She's the co-author of How to Make IC Packages, a columnist for printed circuit design and Fab Circuit Assembly uh, and other publications. And she is a member and often a very senior member of a large string of uh, organizations with multi-letter acronyms. So I won't bore you with that, but she's definitely a rock star. She's always a pleasure to work with. And with that, I will turn this over to Jan. Thanks for inviting me to present to you today. Um, Let's uh, so we can start off the new year and kind of have a little bit of outlook for, you know, not only this year, but a little bit further out from this year as well. But uh, definitely we'll talk a lot about this year and um, a lot of the things that are going on. So um, we're seeing, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of um, of basically interesting things happen. I think last year we could say it was all about surviving the chip crunch. Um, we had a lot of disruptions from COVID. Um, in, and we had a lot of out of cycle demand and, you know, PCs, tablets, wearables. We saw a lot of server growth, things like that. Um, we had a lot of lockdowns that disrupted production. And we've actually still seen some of that starting up in this year. We had a terrible winter weather storm here in Texas, and we're getting ready for another one of those. And I looked at my iPhone weather and it says we're going to have five days of freezing. So, folks, get ready. Texas is going to do it to you again. Um, we also had a little um, fire at uh, Renaissance in Japan, which knocked out some um, microprocessor production, and they've got things getting back up there now. And uh, so we kind of got over those things. 
Um, we also saw a, a big decline in 2020 for the auto industry and a big rebound last year. And what happened was companies really didn't have their place in line. And so because they'd been operating at a just in time mode, they're still really suffering from the, the semiconductor shortages and the semiconductor shortages are really still plaguing our auto sector this year as well, despite the fact that we've got a lot of uh, interesting things going on. So we see that as a lot of shortages of microcontrollers and sensors. So, you know, kind of bad timing on all fronts that caused some of that. There's, um, I think that the trade disputes between the US and China have really re resulted in some supply chain disruptions. We had a lot of people trying to move their fab capabilities out of, um, out of uh, China using some of the foundries there and trying to move in at other places. So it's kind of a dislocation of, uh, of production. Um, so that's caused a little bit of issues. Um, and I don't think we really see the semiconductor shortage um, improving till after 2022. Um, and, and that really depends on where our demand goes for laptop servers, smartphones, things like that. So it's going to be an interesting time. Um, so this year's probably still going to be tight. Now I did see a Morgan Stanley report that thought that we were going to be at, you know, plenty of stuff by the end of the year. So uh, maybe we'll see, but uh, we think it's going to be, you know, kind of continued basically, um, you know, depends on how much demand we have for things and what's going on. So if we look at semiconductor growth, it's been a party. Uh, the semiconductor growth in 2020 was about 6.8%. It was 25.6% in 2021, the largest increase since 2010, when it was a, you know, 31.8%. And we've got a pretty strong growth projected, about an 8.8% growth for 2022. So that's a pretty strong growth in terms of dollar values. Um, and of course, obviously it's not as big as this year, but you know, it's still pretty good growth. So I think that uh, people can look at that healthy, but you know, there's a lot of people out there that think that this party never ends. And I'm here to tell you, having been in this industry for a rather long time, the party does end at some point and the lights come back up and you're sitting there looking at a different situation. So what we've seen is a lot of capacity expansion that's going on and announced uh, capacity expansion all across the world. So this is, and it's both in 200 millimeter and 300 millimeter. Now this is a, a chart that Simi put together um, based at, and released about the end of last year. So there have actually been announcements since this has been, uh, since they put this out. I mean, I think they continually have to update this. Um, and so, you know, we, we see that there's a lot of announcements through 2024. And so there's a lot of people being concerned that we could go into an overcapacity situation and you know what that does to prices. So one of the expansions that we've noticed, of course, we saw that in, I'm not sure of the exact number right now, but we know it's more than $24 billion that Intel plans to spend, um, two new fabs in Arizona. One's the foundry, um, the expansion in New Mexico fabs in Europe, a uh, new fab just announced in Columbus, Ohio. And that one wasn't in that semi data, uh, TSMC planning on spending hundred billion for overseas expansion through for all their expansion through 2023. The Arizona fab starting with a capacity of 20,000 wafers a month by 2024 for the five nanometer technology. Uh, we've got announcements working on the, the fab in Japan. That's really going to supply the, um, the 22 and 28 nanometer nodes for like image sensors and microcontrollers, which will help us a lot with some of that automotive problem. And they're considering a plan in Germany. Um, Global Foundries has something that looks like around a $5 billion uh, plant spin plan. Um, a new 300 millimeter fab in Singapore, new fab uh, expansion in the US. Um, SMIC has about an $8.8, $7 billion uh, expansion. Uh, basically it's, it's around, um, I think it's an $8.9 billion for the Shanghai 300 millimeter uh, plan, depending on what you look at for your, um, for your numbers and your um, exchange rate. Samsung is going to expand their operations here in Texas. They'll have another new fab. It's even, it's like four times as big as the one they already have here. So a lot of expansion going on. So, you know, one of the things is that I think that governments have really focused on, on the semiconductor industry and the fab side of things. And 
I would say that we're in a new arms race in semiconductors. Now, the interesting thing about this, though, is all these governments around the world, whether it's the U.S., China, everybody, it seems to be a lot of emphasis on semiconductor fab only and not probably enough attention to back in. Now, there's a few exceptions to that, but not very many. Um, you know, we've got this 52 billion CHIPS Act money that we're talking about uh, spending. There's, um, I know that Commerce has put out a request for information that's circulating around that talks about, you know, the kinds of, it talks about a, a national advanced manufacturing program. Um, what I don't see is enough emphasis on some of our critical shortfall areas um, in things like substrate capability um, and things like that. And we worked very closely with IPC to put out a, a document that's um, that's free to everybody on the, the situation and what that means in terms of spending just on semiconductors and why you need to look at the rest of the infrastructure. So that's going to be a, a link to that and executive summary up on our website probably by the end of today if you can uh, if you want to access that. And, and the reason that there's been a lot of emphasis on this in the U.S. is because only 12 percent of global semiconductor manufacturing capacity exists in the U.S. But I would argue that if you don't have packaging capacity to support whatever you're trying to do here, it, it really doesn't matter because you're just going to turn around and send whatever semiconductors you make here back over to, to Asia to be packaged. Now, the U.S. has got a lot of activities. They've got, um, you know, that's why they've been discussing with TSMC and why Intel has talked about putting in fab capacity there. Um, you know, the China investments, $150 billion in semiconductors from 2014 to 2020. Um, you know, so India is talking about um, semiconductor production as part of Made in India. Now, they did have a minister that actually got on a YouTube video and talked about packaging, which I was happy to see. But um, I think that, you know, in general, I would say there's been a lot of emphasis on semiconductor fab capability and not enough emphasis on the back end. And we're all in the back end, so I think we have a call to action here for us to try to educate those people that are going to spend our tax dollars on what they might need to consider when they're spending. Because if you put it all in semiconductor fab, uh, I don't think you'll solve all the problems. Now let's look at some of the growth areas that we're expecting for, for last year and this year and see what we think is going to happen. Because if we don't have a stronger growth in some of these areas, then the demand will not be the same as it was last year for semiconductors, meaning by the time we put all this capacity in place, we will have overcapacity. And so that's kind of why we want to look at all these different areas. So demand has increased, um, you know, in the automotive sector. Um, we've got a lot of safety features going on. The um, electric vehicles are seeing very strong growth. Uh, the U.S. has this goal of half the vehicles sold being, um, by 2030, being electric. Um, and it's a very small percent of sales right now. We've seen some statistics that say only 2% um, right now of last year. And in the last year or so, and then the um, the average car, the 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 electric vehicle, um, at least a hybrid, has um, about three thousand five hundred chips with a value of thousand dollars, according to some of the U.S. International Trade Commission reports. And um, we've seen that there's a big, a big increased demand for charging stations. There should be four hundred to five hundred thousand with the new infrastructure bill. Um, this is creating demand for a lot of our power packages, silicon carbide, things like that. So we're doing a lot of analysis on this and trying to look at the packaging for these things. And um, we'll be releasing some information on that pretty soon. And, of course, the problem is these semiconductor shortages impact what we want to do, whether it's an electric vehicle or whether it's a conventional a gas vehicle, because um, you just simply can't ship the whole car unless you've got all the pieces. So we've seen uh, uh, the auto demand increased, as I said, last year. Um, basically, a lot of the companies expect to see these shortages continue this year. Um, so we're, we've seen that, in turn, cause revenue losses. Um, the basically, we do have people working on increasing output. Uh, for example, the Renesis 200 millimeter uh, Kyushu fab and the 300 millimeter Naka fab are at full capacity. Um, and they're using TSMC for some. They they for every um, um, for every um, you know one 
they make, they order six from TSMC. So they do depend on outsourcing as well. Uh, TSMC is going to build fabs in Japan to support some of this activity, so that should help. We still see this shortage. One of the things that's really plagued us is this shortage of 200 millimeter wafer capacity. Um, but we see that increasing, and SEMI certainly put out some information that we should get to a record high in 200 millimeter. In the smartphone area, we expect to see some growth again. Um, IDC was projecting about 5.3% uh, growth rate, um, you know, to about uh, 1.35 for this past year. Um, and they're basically putting a 3.5% growth rate for the CAGR for the, um, um, over the next through 2025. And of course, a lot of that is um, for our 5G smartphones, uh, at least things at capability. Now we've, we've looked at that and you might be a little bit disappointed about the 5G capabilities on your phone because you might find that LTE provides you some um, faster, faster downloads, but, um, or uploads depending on where you are. And so I, I think that, um, you know, this, some of the growth really is tied to how good the service is going to be provided for 5G. So there's, um, uh, there's a question in my mind as to how excited people get if they don't really get good service on a new 5G phone. But um, nonetheless, we have a projection for about 3.5% growth, which is pretty good, but it's certainly not the double digit growth we used to see several years back. Um, if we look at some of the differences between like an iPhone 12 and an iPhone 13, and we've done this in some of our, our recent teardowns, um, we found that the iPhone 12 contained about 310 die and 185 packages. Interestingly, the iPhone 13 um, has 176 packages, a lot of SIP, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, but um, with the, uh, you know, that, that kind of increasing the more modules we're seeing. Uh, these are things like the MIMS and the sensors and RF and connectivity and power management. Interestingly, we saw fewer of the um, wafer level packages in the iPhone 13, maybe because there were fewer voltage regulators, ESD protection diodes and magnetic sensors. So, you know, but still one of the largest numbers of wafer level packages for any company. We also have heard uh, that IDC projects that the PC forecast um, this this year, this coming five year growth rate to be about 3.3%. I think last year it reached about 344.7 million units. So it was a big growth last year over the previous year. But of course that's tapering off a, a little bit to a modest growth rate. So if you think about what's big volumes, smartphones, PCs, and that they're not growing at the same rate they grew last year, I don't think you need quite so many semiconductors. Um, now, we do see server growth continuing, um, projected to reach about 18 million uh, unit servers in you know, 2022. Um, concerns with component shortages are an issue, uh, but this has really driven a lot of our new package development. Um, I would say that this high performance area is a very important area. And one of the things that's driven is the growth in chiplets. Um, we'll see that um, Intel will introduce this year their first a CPU with chiplets for the Sapphire Rapids. And um, so that'll be very exciting. But this chiplet thing is very important. We're just at the very beginning of this. It's a really new era that we've gone into. And it's going to be, as TSMC says, the key enabler for the next 10 to 20 years. And it's really being driven by this growth in die size. If you look at the die size increases that we've seen for server CPUs and GPUs over time, we've seen NVIDIA with, you know, past the reticle size die, 826 square millimeters, Samsung with die of 750 square millimeter. I mean, obviously we need more transistors, but we've got to come up with a more economic approach to fabricate that and use that, that, that function. And so that's why people have introduced things like heterogeneous integration or chiplets <clears throat> to really harness what we have always traditionally wanted to achieve in our semiconductor high-end category, but at the same time be economically minded. So that's why we really have this chiplet. Now, what do you mean by chiplet? Many of you have heard me say this before, but let me just, for anybody who's not familiar with this, 
This chiplet thing is an integrated circuit block that's really designed to work with the other integrated blocks. And it's to perform a, a larger, more complex system that's making use of these reusable IP blocks. And you can do this by partitioning a die into functions that are more cost effective. You get a smaller die, which is higher yield. So you fab the, the high end stuff, the, the most critical performance stuff in the most bleeding edge nodes. And then you use the controller functions or some other function in a less advanced node. This thing is a hard IP block. It's got to function with other chiplets. So you got to co-design it and you can't be designing the silicon in isolation. You remember the old days where people used the silicon people never talked to the package people until they all got together at the end of the day and said, here, go package this thing. Those days are gone. So the really important thing about this chiplets though, is it's really made possible because you're having this chiplet interface communication between these various IP blocks. And that's mostly proprietary today. There's a lot of work going on on open standards um, to you know, allow um, you know, like third-party chiplets and things like that, but we're still, we're still a ways from that. Now, this is not like our traditional system in package or an MCM because it's not just off the shelf, shelf chips that we're combining to do this. It's, and don't think about it as a package. It's not a package. Think about it as a design philosophy. And we have to think more about system level planning, co-design of IC and package, really thinking of chip. This is a really heavy on chip design. So our EDA tool providers are going to have to really help us step up to the plate with this one. And it's really going to have the same impact as when the industry moved from peripheral chip layouts to area array. So it's a really important development. And as I try to tell people, chiplet is not a package. There are many different package options for these chiplets. And I've just listed a few here. We have MCM, the organic substrate, which is what AMD brought out. It's in their third generation. We have embedded bridge, third or fourth generation now, embedded bridge and laminates. That's what Intel's EMIB is going to be for that new um, server they're bringing out this year. Fan out on substrate with embedded bridge. That's what um, AMD has introduced um, with their uh, new EFB technology, working with their uh, subcontractors on that. Uh, we also have 3D stacking, which is what the Vcash is all about. Some of our early work is when with microbonding, but the Vcash that AMD is bringing out with TSMC's SOIC is actually with hybrid bonding. So that's um, no bump there, just the pad to pad. We also still have silicon interposer. And I would argue that the um, Xilinx FPGA on COAS could be considered uh, a chiplet design because each one of these little these slices actually have to communicate with the other with each other. Um, and that's um, I would I would consider that a chiplet design. Now we have um, of course the AMD one. This is multiple generations of desktop and server products with a laminate substrate. Um, and they've published many papers and talked about how the advantages are of that technology for them. As I mentioned, the Intel data center CPU will be with the EMIB, where we'll have a lot of these little embedded bridges uh, in the laminate substrate. They're going to be four chiplet die um, across that. And so this will be uh, shipping to people. Uh, hopefully we'll get one of these and tear it down sometime. Um, the AMD elevated um, embedded bridge, uh, elevated, ele elevated fan out bridge, the EFB is really geared to provide even better performance than if we were embedding something in a substrate. And this is kind of targeted at your AI machine learning type applications. And this will be done by the subcon. So it's not at the foundry itself. It's the embedded bridges in the fan out. And when we do more fan out, that really opens up the opportunities for uh, the subcons to help play in this as well. We also have um, Intel has done uh, some 3D stacking of chiplets with their um, Foveros technology. You can see that that's stacked with micro bumps somewhere around a, um, a, like a 50, around 50 or so micron bump pitch. And they want to go to maybe as fine as 36 microns before they eventually end up going to a hybrid bond. Um, we actually did a teardown of one of these things um, that was in the Samsung Galaxy Note S. And the advantages are just of going to the 3D with the micro bumps 
was um, one-tenth the standby power, 50% graphic performance improvement, 40% core board area decrease, and a 50% height reduction. So there are advantages even before you get to the um, hybrid bonding. But um, we also had seen introductions of Samsung's X-Cube, uh, their first generation of 3DIC will be using micro bumps, but then they're also working on hybrid bonding as well. So we'll see something coming out of their foundry offerings. Of course, TSMC has published a lot with their SOIC technology, where you go to those very fine bond pitches with no bump, and the first commercial product will be the uh, Vcash for AMD coming out this year in volume. And um, it's remember to the, look at this. Don't think of this SOIC as a package, but it goes into a package. So it's the way of partitioning the chips in a 3D stack and then packaging something that looks like a chip, but is actually multiple chips connected with hybrid bonding. And like I said, that's, um, that's a Vcash, um, that's AMD's Vcash will be our product of the year, if you will, um, with the hybrid copper to copper bonding. And so that will be, um, it's a really clever design. And again, I emphasize the importance of design to, you know, where they've gone in and solved some of the thermal problems that we might see with 3D stacking by designing the structure so that the memory uh, and the cores are really not placed on top of each other. So there's some really clever design aspects of this. So um, I think that um, that it, it's probably been a, a lot of work and heavy workload to get this out, but it'll be very exciting to see. Now, one of the challenges that we see moving forward is that all these packages we discuss for chiplets um, use a laminate buildup substrate. And we still see this shortage for these laminate buildup materials. Um, it's whether you're talking about a chiplet or whether you're talking about just a flip chip BGA for say the, um, the processor power that goes into a automotive application for another part of a server or many, many, many products for the PCs, for everything. These are using the buildup substrates for these high performance applications. And also in your media chips, your set top boxes, a lot of your ASICs. And so, you know, the situation unfortunately is going to be worse this year than it was last year. Now, there's a lot of capacity announcements for buildup substrates and they're going to bring online capacity, but you know, it takes about two years to get all the equipment and put the things in place and building new factories takes time. So unfortunately, the situation is going to be worse next year as well. And maybe we'll have some improvement by 2024, 20, 20, 25, 26, as long as we constrain our body size and don't go crazy. Because really the problem has been the body size increases that really take up so much, so many panels to produce those. So, so we are going to be able to somewhat narrow the gap in the out years, but it's still going to be quite challenging this year and next. And um, I think that one of the things we've discovered in a lot of the work and analysis that we've done is yield improvement will really help us um, in the interim stage, and it'll certainly help bring up those new lines quickly. So. Metrology developments are very important. We're looking at a couple right now, and uh, we think that this is really um, a key area that needs a lot of attention and a lot of emphasis, um, so that we uh, need to um, spend a little more time on this. So also I want to take a note here, we need to watch China. We're seeing some slowing um, of growth there. Uh, there's a major debt problem there. And they really have a closed border policy and a zero COVID policy to try to keep their things um, under control. And that really can also play havoc with our supply chains as well as that continues. And so I think it's, um, you know, remember, we're a global world and global economies and they're all connected together. So bad things happening in one place have a tendency to cause bad things to happen in others. So kind of in conclusion, I'd, I'd like to say that we expect the semiconductor industry growth to be continuing this year, uh, a lot lower than the growth last year, and the industry is probably going to experience some overcapacity in 2023, 2024. And you know what that means. That means prices will drop so that the dollar value growth rate won't be so big and will, you know, everybody will be happy with the prices that they get. 
Um, demand is probably going to be more normal for our PCs and smartphones, uh, according to the data that we've seen by a number of people. And um, I think our economic growth can be derailed by, if we have too aggressive a monetary policy, any increase in trade friction, and certainly political instability, and as well as continued COVID issues. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And I think I've left hopefully a lot of time for questions and discussion. Thank you, Jan. Um, great always to hear your outlook and I see some of the questions coming in. Um, before we do, um, one of my questions is why, why do you think uh, 5G is going to disappoint us on the demand side? Do you see? Well, we, we've done some, we just did some speed tests ourselves and um, um, it's, it's just not living. And we've talked to a number of other people and we've certainly seen a lot of things in the press. It's just not living up to those promises on the ads that were being put out there by the, uh, by these service providers. Okay. And I think right. that's one of the things I've seen a number of analyst reports that say we really depend on 5G to drive our phone sales. And, you know, the snafu that we've had with this, you know, C-band and whether we can, you know, everybody got in a little, you know, upset about, you know, whether we can put the, 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 the C-band um, close to the airports because of interference. And that has to do with the, um, the, you know, the spectrum that you're in and things like that. Right. And um, could you drop your slide share unless you think you're going to need to go back? And uh, just... I hope not. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, so let's, let's uh, do some of the questions uh, from the audience. Um, is Amazon Graviton using EMIB, if you happen to know or no, kind of comment? Okay. Okay, and obviously trying to get some of those to tear down may be a little difficult, but okay. Um, how about HBM? Uh, do you see that moving from hybrid bonding from, you know, like a, a next generation of HBM using it? Well, HBM3 is not scheduled to come out until I believe next year. Um, I think that certainly people have got to look at a way if they want to stack 12 high to get it kind of in the same size category. But... Um, you know, certainly, obviously, I think these companies, probably SK and Samsung are probably looking at this. Um, I don't know where they are with it. Um, it usually takes them quite a while to adopt some of these new packaging technologies. So it, it could be a while. I mean, uh, well, that's, that's another thing I want to say. Hybrid bonding looks really easy in PowerPoint. <laughs> Yeah. So PowerPoint not, engineering is PowerPoint great. Engineering. But, you know, it's a lot harder than it looks. So I think that people tend to think that you can jump into these things a lot quicker. And, you know, you've got to look at the yield. So, I mean, everything we do moving forward, I'd say we really have to pay very close attention to what the yield looks like and what we need to do to those processes to get them to have higher yield. Um, actually, what's the, you know, do you, uh, what, what's the state of the art of multi-die stacking on hybrid bonding? I mean, how, how high is anybody really shipping or well, uh, I mean, you know, prototyping? Hybrid bonding has been used in the image sensor stuff for a while. So that's not, that's, you know, at Sony, at Samsung. Maybe like so, three layers. No idea. But, but I mean, for the, for the, the V cash, I'm not sure what the height is on that package, but. The Vcash is, I think, our, our first, you know, product that'll come out this year that we'll actually get to see and measure and take a look at. So um, I, I don't know what the height is. Okay, got it. Um, there was something else. Um, let's see. Um, talking about hybrid bonding, um, any, you know, do you see any new capabilities that are going to be needed like in uh metrology inspection for hybrid yeah, copper think, to copper i think you're going to have to really be very careful with that um i think that anything you can work on using the um the um the um you know the cleanliness levels and how you can do that uh i think that um that 
you know that those are those are certainly things that we need to to kind of um, work on assembly equipment um, you know inspecting the, the the pads before we put them together um, all those kinds of things but I think people are, are the people that are doing it are well aware of those issues okay. um, there is a bunch of questions here um, you know the the buzz of metaverse you know Facebook renaming the meta and but you know the the technology that people are talking about there the ar vr and the sensors etc you know, do you see them driving advanced packaging needs either increasing volume or in different directions um we have not we looked at some of the original you know glasses and things that were put out and those were you know kind of interesting but mostly using conventional packaging um i would imagine those things have to be a bit cost sensitive and, um, you know, so I, I'm not sure what they have in mind for those yet. So we'll, we'll stay tuned on that. I did see a question coming in on the opto, the photonics, which um, I'd, I'd like to comment on. I didn't sure. in the presentation, but, yeah. but I noticed that that, you know, that seems to have shifted out. Again, another example of how co-packaged optics is a lot more difficult than people make it out to be where you attach your laser, um, you know, all the things that, that that are going on with that. And I certainly think that that's a, a very important technology that is going to um, need to be developed. Um, we thought we would start seeing some things at the end of, you know, 2024, 25, but it looks like it's, it's slipping out a little bit further um, than that. So kind of a little bit getting past some of our, um, our, our, forecasting horizons. And I think that there's a lot of things that need to be worked on there. And that's probably an area where, you know, we could use some government uh, industry partnerships and perhaps some funding to work toward some of those solutions. And um, I personally like some of the things I've seen in Europe with the emphasis on workforce training over there um, in the photonics area and how we might um, kind of work on something for the future. Do you think the photonics are, is primarily going to stay, let's say, what I call a commercial technology, i.e. in the data center? Or do you think uh, really we're going to finally get a lot more fiber to the home at speeds? Well, we've seen that... it in both. We've seen it in both. We've seen, um, I know Infinera has really had a lot of focus on the, um, the, the telecommunication side of things and others have as well. And I think that we'll see both, actually. Um, data center seems to get a lot of press. So, um, and I know that Intel got a lot of press with some of their early um, announcements of their co-packaged optics. And I certainly think that that's probably some of the activities that'll take place in New Mexico. But I think that there are other people that are looking at this as well. Um, I'd like to remind the audience, please put the tools and the, the questions in the Q&A and not the chat, because it's too hard to keep track of which ones we've answered in the chat. So I know a bunch of you have put it in the chat. Please put it in the Q&A. Thank you. Um, so let's see. There's a. Um, let's talk about laminate substrates again. Um, where, you know, what, one of the things you commented about was the yield. I mean, what's what kind of yield, where, where are we on the learning curve? I mean, what's sort of a reasonable yield? Where are we well, at? That, I mean, how much headroom is there? That's the problem is it depends on your substrate design. If you design something that has, you know, nine, 10 layers of buildup on each side of your core, and you have a large area of that, that's say 90 by 90, 100 by 100, your yield is probably not going to be too good. So, you know, it's, it's very, very challenging because it's a sequential process. So every layer you, you put down has the potential for, um, you know, having a low, a low, you know, lowering the yield. Now, right. if you're talking about something like the 222 substrate, boy, you could probably get those at above 90% yield um, and a reasonable area, say 35 by 35 or something along those lines, 27 by 27, 23 by 23. I mean, I think that those are... Those are things that you can build day in and day out um, and at high yield. And, and the designs are not, they're not hairy designs, okay? But when you get up into some of these things that we're talking about for servers, for network processors, and by the way, those photonics people, I've heard people talk about up to 150 by 150 millimeter 
package stuff, right? Now, right, right. think about that for a second. How many of those are you going to get on one panel? Those That's are on your panel cool. size. You yeah, could go well, to Gen 5, you know. Well, <laughs> but, I mean, your panel sizes that are in there, you're talking 510 by 515, maybe some 600 yeah. by 600. But you're, you're not going to get that many parts per panel. So that means that your, your substrate is going to be very expensive. Yeah. And your yield is going to be very low. So, you know, it's, it's, I mean, we kind of need some breakthrough technologies in the way we do our substrates. Obviously, it's mostly build up today, and that's both the Ajinomoto and the Sekisui that are being qualified. We understand that some other people are interested in bringing new materials into this space, but those are the two that have been qualified by most of the uh, build up substrate suppliers that are the household names. Right. And so, in terms of the, your, your capacity that you see coming online, is that for, you know, say confirmed or, you know, pretty certain business or is this the usual building they will come? That... Oh, no, no, no. These substrate suppliers finally wised up. They're not putting in capacity unless their users, you know, help write the checks because it's, it's over a billion dollars to put in one of these substrate facilities. And so yeah. in order to do that, you've got to have support, support from your customers. And let's face it, these customers have not been kind to our substrate makers for, for, for a long, long, long time. And I've been telling people, you know, you got to be kind to your suppliers because, you know, you really depend on them. And so, you know, they didn't put in a lot of capacity for a while back and simply because they were worried that they'd put in over capacity. So, you know, I mean, Maybe you'll have close to, maybe you'll have getting close to overcapacity by 2026, but it, it depends on what happens with yield and body size. Got it. Okay. And um, related and to this, way, also one more thing, if, if you are not, if you have not engaged with a substrate manufacturer and have a working relationship with them and you want some substrates this year or next year, you are out of luck. Got it. Yep. Got to have established relationships. You're just right. not going to walk in cold call. Um, talking about the the laminates, you know, sort of, kind of where's the where's the demand or where's the leading edge in like line and space and the uh, I mean, is this uh, leading edge? Well, today, I mean, if you look at EMIB, that's nine micron space, twelve micron line. We're seeing some eight micron line and space um, type substrates. Um, you know, we've heard people talk about 5.5. Five. I, I think there's some question as to whether you can actually take these films down to 2.2. Two. So that's why people are working on a lot of RDL type capabilities and, and things for um, a different type of substrate material for future really fine feature sizes. And you ask, well, why do you need those fine feature sizes? Well, if you, you know, if you have finer pitch, on the the bump pitch or pad pitch you're going to have to have finer features to route that so that's that's where some of that's coming from also i think a lot of people have talked more about putting the hbm uh, next to the um the processor and you know that's why people had done so much on silicon interposer because that allowed you the density to do that i think you can do some of that similar density on a fan out rdl structure because you can go two micron line in space um, but then, you know, you're still in any of those configurations, whether it's silicon interpose or fan out, you still got a substrate base. The question is, how many layers does that substrate base have to have? And, um, you know, what's the layer count on it? Can you get that base substrate where it has a higher yield? Um, and then you're, you have less, less of a concern. So, so there's a lot of balancing act. It's not you know, nothing's really, it's not easy. Right. It's a trade-off and you still have all the usual, you know, defects per area and, and layers and yeah, it's, and then the further you push the technology that, you know, it usually take a yield hit. So it's just the cycle. So with that, you know, let's look at modern smartphones. I mean, they have pretty complex, printed circuit boards that are almost probably, you know, you could almost call it a large substrate. I mean, in some ways, how, how are we going to see, you know, somebody on the leading edge go to chiplet based designs and there's only going to be like four packages in a phone or are we going to. Uh, 
there seems to be a lot of components in a phone, a lot of different components, right. do lots of different things. I mean, you know, so I, I don't think you're going to, I mean, can you build with modules and do things like that? I think a couple of people have tried that already. I'm not Google sure. did, yeah. Um, but, but I mean, there's a lot of different features. Obviously, we are seeing more modules, um, you know, functionality wise. Um, but um, then, you know, just single die packages or even just a, a, a die by itself in a wafer level package. But, but I mean, I don't think you're going to reduce this count down too much. Um, you, you still have a lot of different functions that those modules have to meet. So I don't think you're going to put it. And, you know, the more things you put, you know, and people ask me about this in a multiple chip, the more chips you put together in the package, the more chance you have for things to go wrong. So, you know, it's a function of numbers. It's a numbers game. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I'm trying to think. We did have to... another question um, on here about the um, domestic um, OSAD expansion um, mm -hmm. and SK's glass substrates. Um, you know, this uh, company in, outside of Atlanta has talked about they're putting in this glass substrate line and they're, they're targeting some things now. You know, it's not in yet. I haven't seen any customers yet, but it's it's certainly an interesting technology based on all the Georgia Tech research. So we'll see where that goes. I know that people in the past had used glass substrates for RF, um, and so that might be a play. Um, I haven't heard any major CPU manufacturers that have ponied up to that yet, but, um, you know, anything's, anything's possible. Um, with, with onshoring or, you know, discussion about, you know, and the need to have the rest of, you know, to move back end and back to the U.S. I mean, do you think anybody or would it make any economic sense to, to do the whole range? Or do you think if there was activity that made sense in the U.S., it would only be like cutting edge, you know, chiplet or, you know, SIP sort of work? Well, it depends on what you want to do. I certainly think that you you can't move all lead frame production back to the U.S. There are no <laughs> right. manufacturers. There are no, you know, but we do have a, a number of smaller companies with capabilities for assembly here. So it depends on what you want to do, what your goal is. I mean, certainly the defense companies need to have some of their things assembled here. Um, but um, I think that um, that you need to make sure that you have some options for people. Um, and certainly, you know, I think you need to have um, at least some capabilities on some of the very advanced technologies here. And maybe that's where the emphasis should be. Um, I think that, um, I think that this is, um, um, you know, a, a discussion that we need to continue to have. Right. And, so, um, we're related to this, I mean, do you think you know, there was a question about, and may, maybe the answer on a lot of these that people want specific answers, they should probably uh, uh, buy your report or hire your time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it would be nice. Be nice. Uh, they were asking, um, you know, like, this, this one was about DECA technologies, you know, you know, yeah, DECA has licensed their uh, process to Skywater, who's going to bring it up down in that bridge facility. So um, that's very exciting news. Um, so that'll put some capability here. Um, I know that we have um, uh, companies that, you know, have some other capabilities for Interposer and some packaging capabilities and some hybrid bonding work out at, um, um, out at, um, the, they bought the Novati facility here in Austin. I think it's Scorpios um, in New Mexico. So there's a couple of things, um, you know, that are that are here that are that. So we, we do have some things here. It's not like we're, we're we're in a desert, but we we probably need to emphasize some things more. Right. And when we have a comment that somebody thinks that ASC also licensed the DECA patent too, but um, that's the M series to do the uh, fan out wafer level package. Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, you, you talked about the lead frames. You know, question was, you know, is there a looming shortage in lead frame? I don't know, capacity or? There's still a shortage of lead frames because, again, you know, people just beat the crap out of the lead frame suppliers till they couldn't make any money. Some people had to close their operations. They're trying to put a little bit of capacity back in. But, 
you know, it's like people haven't learned. You got to be kind to your suppliers because they will disappear on you and then you're in a world of hurt. But, um, you know, yeah, lead frames, long lead times on lead frames. Sorry, guys. Um, th this one, I, I don't think you're going to anoint one a winner, but the, the question was, is there a winner among the two and a half D technologies? There's a, a whole basket of different technologies. So the question is, do you see the market playing out that there is a winner or do they all sort of coexist because they all make sense for different things? Well, see, that's the subject of our panel discussion at the IMAPS DPC in March, which we're going to try to hold in person in Arizona. So that is the very topic that we're going to address. And I'd like to say that, you know, personally, no one package meets all needs, but we do need to sit down and talk about what are the advantages of each package for the different applications. And you have to go through a, a list. Uh, Xilinx has put out a rather nice table of a checklist of things that you can go through to decide which package you should use for your particular application. But no, there's not one, this is not one, you know, it's like a, it's not an easy exercise. So it's a very challenging, um, you know, task to pick the right package for your application. I agree. And, you know, the, the trick is also to figure out what is available in the market as you design your product too. Yes. So, yes. yep. Um, a topic near and dear to me um, about test capabilities. Similarly, I mean, um, they would be essential to implementing all the assembly technologies you're talking about. Do you, you know, you talked about, hey, bring back packaging, but when you say that, are you also considering bringing the test along with it? Or do you think that would still be, you know, even further down the uh, tail being wagged? Well, I think that one of the things that I learned after attending the, um, you know, the uh, failure analysis conference that they had in Arizona this past October was that, you know, design for test is really important. And I don't think that we in this industry, in the front end of the design cycle, spend enough time talking to the test people and the failure analysis people, by the way, right. about what those issues are. Because maybe if we had a little bit more conversation there, we could help make better choices. And certainly I think design for test is becoming a very, 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 very important topic for people. Um, and certainly I think that you're gonna see, you know, where you put your tests, where you put your probes for, you know, for example, some of your chiplet designs where for your, you know, for hybrid bonding and things like that, whether you have sacrificial probe areas or all those kind of issues, those are going to have to be worked out because, you know, certainly I don't think you're going to do the stack and pray plan because that's just, uh, that's, that's, it's not a working, <laughs> not a good working model. Right. Um, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying who asked it. Uh, hi, Mark. Mark Lepetis asked, do you think the CHIPS Act will make any difference from the, for more U.S. fabs or packaging plants? Well, I didn't see much in the CHIPS Act that's going to give me uh, hope for um, a lot of packaging activity or substrate manufacturing specifically. I've heard, you know, that it's really a lot of silicon uh, focus. And, you know, honestly, I think that's because, you know, we our, our representatives that are, you know, that are handling this. Um, don't really understand all about, you know, what's needed in the ecosystem. And so I really think that each one of us has a duty to try to help educate um, our members of Congress, our people in government on why this whole thing is important, why the whole ecosystem is important, and why you can't just throw money at silicon and all problems are solved. And by the way, it's not just one and done either. So you can't just throw money today and walk away. And then, you know, is you got to ask yourself, is it a good thing if you have so much capacity in place that prices for things start dropping? So, you know, it's 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 um it, it's a it's something that requires a lot more thought than generally our policymaking community um, has been able to grapple with at this point. And I'd also say that also probably um 
applies to the investor community too. The I mean, community as well. People know the marquee names, but you know they don't know the packaging houses. You know they know the Nvidia's and the Intels, and yep. but two order two two steps down the supply chain, they don't understand what the companies do. Yeah, the problem in our industry is silicon has always been sexy, packaging has not, and we need to get our packaging ecosystem up front and in the conversations a lot more in order to really enable the kinds of things that we would like to do with our with our future technologies, whether it's chiplets, whether that's, you know, photonics or co-packaged optics or whatever it is. So it's 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 just if I had one message today, I would say, guys, it's sales. It's not all just about silicon. There's a lot of other things to be considering. Yeah. Cool. Um, there are way more questions here than I think we have time for. So any any other last uh, comments you would like to make? Or um, No, I thank you all for attending this. Um, you know, please stay safe out there. I know we're trying to have a couple of in-person conferences coming up. We're trying to hold the IWLPS in San Jose in mid-February and IMAPS DPC in March and then ECTC and the end of May. And, you know, I know that Ira, you've got some some conferences that you're trying to yep. go in person. And, you know, we got to all get figure out a way to all get back together and, uh, you know, see what we can do um, to help ourselves, you know, stay safe, but still have these discussions moving forward, because I think we're going to have to really educate each other on what's needed um, to get our supply chain you know, back to normal and our ecosystem working properly. Great. Thank you very much, Jan. So uh, thank, thank you everyone for joining today's Semiconductor Industry Speaker Series workshop uh, produced by MEPTEC and IMAPS. Uh, we'll have the slides up next week. We'll have a recording for the people who missed part of it. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have Jan here. And we'll be announcing future SISS uh, webinars and hopefully return to in-person shortly. Uh, we'll announce those once uh, presenters are confirmed. I'd like to have people uh, reserve the dates, the mornings of March 15th to 16th for our virtual event on, in the Road to Chiplets series, Heterogeneous Integration Testability. And we'll get info out on that. And with that, I will wish everybody a good day and thank you for joining us. I look forward to seeing everyone soon. Take care.